Please welcome Gary Beach. I come with lots of stuff, so uh, I'm going to leave the mic there. That's okay, because then uh, my panels can use the mic. Um, first things first, uh, yeah, Paul told me this, that if you, I come back here about every four years. So and if you sign up today for my 2017 breakfast, oh, I want to I want to speak at the Cape Cod Beer Social next week. Get this breakfast stuff. You know, and I don't have any after Landry either. The capo, the capo of the Cape Cod Technology Council. John and I are dear friends. Um, but if you sign up now, you not only get a great rate, but Paula will pay you. <laughs> You don't need to, 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 to show up here. Uh, just pay Paul $20. Door, that's, that's her middle name. Um, I'm really excited to be here today. We have a great panel, so I'll try to keep my, my comments, uh, frame them uh, in, a, in a short kind of way. How much time do we have, Doug? Uh, okay, I know that far. But for the panel, we got. Typically, we go until about 9 o'clock, okay. and we'll open questions. Sir, okay, so we have 45 minutes. So anyway, seven years ago, I'm in Cincinnati on deadline for a column on CIA Magazine. Didn't know what to write. But at conferences, it was a workforce development conference, you always get great ideas. And it's only 400 words. So somebody was talking about this report. It was called A Nation at Risk. Some of you have heard it. Heard of this. this was written in 1983. If you read it and you take out the reference to Sputnik, it was written about how Japanese uh, manufacturing and automobile, electronics, all this other stuff had eviscerated market share in American industry. Well, guess what? Shame on us because it was an American mathematician named W. Edwards Deming who in 1950 had a tour through Japan on total quality management. How many here heard Six Sigma? Hello? No one Motorola said that's a great idea? 1986, <laughs> exactly 30 years after Deming gave the total quality management religion to the Japanese for free, which is fine. He comes back here, an American industry, I grew up in New Jersey, not on the shore. So close to the shore. And it was a bridge in Trenton. I have a picture of him in the book. It goes, Trent makes and the world takes. So our philosophy back then was, hey, if it breaks, who cares? Send it back, we'll send you another one. Maybe that will work. So anyway, seven years later, it turned into a book. And it's a history book about how we got to the point we're in. And it's, 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 uh, it's, I guess the two words that most people are talking about when they look at the book is a wake-up call. What I try to do, I was born in 1950, connect the dots, if you will, to why American kids in international tests, American kids who are going to work at your companies now in the future, are coming in 27th in math when they're 15 years old. We're not genetically less inferior than the rest of the world. So I try to do is connect some of the dots. How many here took the SAT test prior to 1995? <laughs> How many didn't take the SAT test prior to 1995? <laughs> Nobody, all right. I guarantee you, this is a sales pitch. If you buy the book, and I'm going to tell you guys anyway, you will get 110 points extra on your SAT tests. Here's why. And I'll get to the panel in a second. And this will be the last story because I want to get, get to the uh, technology education part. Baby boomers. First born, 1946. I'm a liberal arts guy. But I can add 17 to 1946, and that's 1963. In 1963, the first class of baby boomers took the SAT test. And guess what? For the next 14 years, they bombed it. Why? Because unfortunately, they were brought up in hard public education systems in the 50s. That was unprepared for the explosion of young people in America. 
both from infrastructure. Teachers, prior to the war, if you wanted to be a teacher, you had to go through incredible certification processes. After the war, we needed teachers. You had a pulse, you could teach. So what happened after this train wreck of SATs, uh, in 1994, the uh, College Entrance Examination Board said, ah, uh, we gotta do this thing called recentering. <laughs> because the mean score, the median score for SATs by 1994 had dropped down to about 440. Remember, you get 800. Now there's three components back. Well, we took the test. There were two, <coughs> verbal and math. So they had to bring it up to 500. So what they did, they gave you all 110 extra points. So I guarantee you, you go back to your offices today, you type in Google Bing. I used to go back to Bing because I'm a visual kind of guy. Um, type in SAT recentering. Bingo, hit this uh, enter button. And, and uh, you will find a site typing your scores, best remembering, recalculating, and, and you'll, you will, you'll get that. But we have a lot of challenges. And I'll just leave with this and bring up our, have Doug introduce our panelists. We're going to try to frame it in terms of you guys and the, the business audience. There's 12 million unemployed Americans, there are 10 million underemployed Americans. And in a, a quirk, since when the Great Recession ended in the summer of 2009, from that point to now, there's been a doubling in the number of open jobs. Jobs that employers put out there that they can't fill. Now, there's a fairly vociferous debate going on about this. It's called the skills gap. And some say, well, it's because employers, you, are being overly selective. In terms of you only want men and women who have gone to the moon and back and are probably already currently employed, so it's not a dead net in terms of knocking down that 3.8 million open jobs. Economists say, ain't such a thing as a skills gap. Why? Because there's no increase in hourly wages. Their thought being that if there were a skills gap, people had the skills, like Mary Cole, they'd have to pay more to get married. Yeah, sounds good. The other thing is, there'd be a lengthening in the number of hours worked per week, right? You can't hire, loan the people on the staff, have to work longer. Ain't happening there. So they say, skills gap, corporate fiction. New York Times editorial board on Father's Day two months ago actually said that. It's corporate fiction. So we're going to talk about that today, but from the lens of, of higher education, as Paul and Doug were talking about, and how we can leverage technology to prepare those young minds so when they come out of, of either community college or a technical school or a four-year school, they have the skills that you need in the employment side. So that's what we're going to talk about today. So I'll, I'll hand back to Doug and, and, and I'm the kind of moderator that if you have a question, it's, enough, it's, it's collegial enough here, just fire away rather than say we'll wait till five to five. So everybody got questions and we'll go from there. Go ahead, Peter. Peter. Gary, thanks for teeing us off. Uh, ask our panelists to join. I know I've seen us off. Hope I didn't tee you off. You sent us something nice to thank you. Um, but uh, Bob Cody, who is Dean of Math, Science, Business, Technology, and Workforce Education at Cape Cod Community College. Bob has a PhD in Organic Chemistry from Rensselaer Polytech Institute and has spent over 25 years in the chemical industry. Uh, I actually worked with Bob in the early 90s at uh, American Sanamid and he's with SciTech Corporation and others. So many years in industry before uh, joining academics. Um, Bob was a featured speaker at the Smarter Cape Summit in May. Uh, Dr. Ruth Sherman is Dean of Continuing Education and Graduate Studies at Curry College in Milton near Blue Hills. Uh, Ruth has a PhD in Higher Education from UMass Amherst. Ruth has 30 years of service in various public and private higher education institutions and is currently leading Curry's five-year strategic plan. Ruth has offered many, authored many articles on higher education issues, presented at national conferences, and has served on numerous educational, economic, uh, 
and educational development boards. Last but not least, uh, Dr. Bill Tauber. Uh, Bill is director of the MBA program at Curry College. Bill has a PhD from Capella University and an MBA from Capital University. Prior to his academic career, Bill was VP of Service and Operations at uh, Workscape. He also has many years at uh, ADP, the Automated Data Processing, as VP and General Manager of Benefits Administration, and Division VP for Employers and Services. Before that, uh, adding to his resume, uh, President of Motor Sound Corporation in Silicon Valley, and VP of Manufacturing for Plaskalite in Columbus, Ohio. So, with our three panelists and Gary, we have over a century of experience in <laughs> business, <laughs> education, <laughs> and technology. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's charge him 40 bucks for breakfast. <laughs> well, I'm going to hand yeah. this to, to Ruth so you guys can pass these to just the mics here. And I'll try to walk around but not disturb, disturb uh, folks here. Um, the first question I wanted to ask, as I was mentioning to the panelists this morning, that in my research, what McKinsey found out was why countries that are performing well perform well. It's not because the countries are homogeneous and we're diverse. It's because these countries have a proactive national education strategy to only hire the best of the teachers. So Lee Iacocca, is quoted as saying, in a truly rational society, the best of us would be teachers, and the rest of us would have to figure out what to do. So I thought, starting with Ruth here, uh, you guys are all examples of the best of us. So just briefly, you know, what, what was your inspiration moment to, to become an educator? For me, I always had a curious mind, and the idea of being able to like children to be curious while continuing to learn as a profession. I couldn't think of anything better to do with my time. So I started 30 years ago. I've taught preschool through college and continue to enjoy my chosen profession. Okay, great. Curiosity, thank you. We now know it's 30. So we know the rest of us gotta get, we have to get another 70 out of here someplace. Because <laughs> we might have more than 100. I think we do. Yeah. I'm sorry. Bob, start? Please. Sure. Um, I actually grew up in a family of educators. My, uh, both my mother and father taught. Uh, my father actually was a dean at the uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. My mom ran a uh, nursing school in the hospital. So, like it or not, I was kind of exposed to that very early on. And for me, one of the first things I actually remember as a kid, my parents gave me for Christmas a chemistry set. So I'm out in the backyard playing things and making things. And that was kind of the start of it. I really enjoyed working with people and, and trying to see how we can figure out stuff. And to me, that was the best part. So again, it's that curiosity piece. I've kind of come to the education world kind of a roundabout way, though. I, I actually started, uh, I went to college to be a high school teacher and a coach. And major in chemistry, had my minor in education, got certified, did my student teaching, got a job offer. I looked at the number and I said, you know, I'm going to grad school. And I ended up in, in the chemical industry for a, quite a long time and circled back around here to the end. And um, it's, it's a great place to be because what I find we're still where we were 25 years ago. We're still trying to figure out how to get to the next step. We just need to figure out how to connect the dots a little better. Thank you, Rob. Bill? Well, this is going to be a bit of a contrast. I am the son of the town baker in Mount Union, Pennsylvania, and my long haul steel truck driver father, Bill, and I never thought I would go to college. I frankly thought I would be driving a truck. I always wanted to do that. And, but I found myself, and I can remember this evening precisely, it was November 10th, and it was 1970. I just returned from Vietnam, and I met I just decided to take a class. You know, just a class, business law. And this professor from Harvard, uh, Dr. Roger Martin, literally turned me on to education. Before that, I was only thinking about getting that Mack truck and heading cross country. But he so lightened the fire 
of curiosity and the notion that all those things that I grew up with were businesses and they were connected from a supply chain and an organizational perspective and an operations perspective. In that one evening, I knew that I wanted to be a teacher. So I'm here now. And uh, I'm glad, glad you got there. a few sojourns to other businesses. Uh, it's, it's, uh, if I may, in terms of you know, your inspiration, our Bill and Ruth and Curiosity and, and Bob, you talk about um, you know, doing stuff. If I, if I just ask, one of the things I found in researching the book, the amount of science are perceived by young Americans as something that's wrong. And all three of you kind of talk about it from, from a personal experience of, of, of doing. And in fact, I, I, I'll just hand it over here and you guys can pass around. This is a picture, it's a grainy picture of technology in a classroom in 1927. You can't see this, let me pass it around. But what is a picture of? Of an LA school teacher in a plane having kids look out the window teaching these kids about geography. So if you guys could just comment on, on the importance of, of the experiential side of getting younger the young Americans interested in science and math. I think what you in your opening remarks you talked about teacher preparation. Teacher preparation had been dismal in this country for decades. And in Massachusetts we prepare educators at Curry, and they, they have so up the ante for teacher preparation. In what ways? Because a teacher prep is huge. There was, you just you have to pass tests now, and right. some tests, literacy tests, subject matter tests, and they're and they're rigorous. They they have a high bar before anyone could become a teacher. And how long has it been in place? For a number of years, they they keep introducing another test. Science is the next test. So that, right. that should be helpful. They they haven't been able to uh, agree on what the test should be measuring. So it's been taking a long time to develop these tests. But it has really um, set the bar higher, higher. And and many people still come to us thinking teaching is easy, and I, anyone can be a teacher. Well, that isn't so anymore. And I think that's where we're going to see real improvement in classroom. We've had people who will say, you know, I'm not very good in math, but no one would ever say, I'm not very good at reading and think they're a literate person. And that's really changing now. So it's, it's about who's in the classroom, who's teaching our kids. And um, I see very positive movement around the accountability for teachers and what the kind of preparation they will need. Before we get Bill and Bob, Ruth made some very interesting points. Number one, we're doing a pretty darn good job in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts teaching. If Massachusetts were a country, we'd be fifth in the world in terms of turning out young men and women in schools to go into, into colleges. But Ruth also mentioned reading. If you look at it from a macro sense, there's these things called the National Assessment of Education Progress that are done every year, every other year, whatever. What would you guess, what percent of American fourth graders do you think are functionally illiterate? It's 36, which is kind of remarkable. You can't read, you know, they, they say from K to three, you learn to read. From four on, you read to learn. So it's, it's, it's but teacher prep is, 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 is absolutely, absolutely critical. Do you guys want to, I don't want to go through all three of you, but if you have something, because we've got a lot of stuff in a half hour, here we go. But anybody want to jump in? Bob? I do, for just for a, a couple of comments. Uh, I think Ruth is very, it's very true. And Massachusetts has done a very good job, better than most states, in terms of making sure that teachers, elementary school teachers particularly, have the science backgrounds that are tested. I moved here three years ago from Connecticut, and I, I'll tell you that in Connecticut, when you are certified as an elementary school teacher, you are an elementary school teacher. You do not necessarily have to have any skill in math or science, but you're expected to teach math or science. And many of our elementary school teachers, quite frankly, are afraid of math. And so they don't teach math. And so when you finally so teach math tricks, is how you teach. You count five, ten tricks to teach math. You don't teach concepts, you don't teach math, you don't teach how it fits into life. 
And so you find that you have students coming up through, up through elementary and secondary school coming to college who are not math prepared. And they are afraid of math because that's what they've been taught all along. Uh, I'll use my daughter as an example. She hates math because that's what, how it's been taught to her. But she's very skilled because it's been forced on her. <laughs> Sorry about that, but it's, it's true. But teachers have to be, I think we have to take it to another level. I think teachers have to be certified to teach math and science at every single level. They can't just have a degree and be certified to teach. They have to be certified in the subject area, math and science specifically. Well, I'm sorry. Just to add on to that, you should know that in Massachusetts now, any school who is preparing <coughs> teachers like Curry College must adhere to the state standards for teacher education. So we can't, Bill can't go walk into the classroom and just teach whatever he wants. We have learning outcomes expected of every student in that classroom that are prescribed by the state. Science is a core competency for even elementary school teachers now. And, and every year the standards keep getting up and up. And now teachers will not only be assessed to teach and be licensed, the state is now looking back at teachers to see where they went to school and how well their students are doing in the classroom. That's right on the horizon, we've been told that they are connecting the dots around there. That's a sea change from anything anyone could have imagined a decade oh ago. The evaluation process is changing, which is critical. But just one other point, if I may. What, what's missing, though, is there, there's teachers in the system who've been in the system for a long time. And what we really aren't doing is the continual professional teacher development so that they can learn how to teach some of these new ways to do that. And that's, that's the part that's really missing. Thanks, guys. I'm going to get Bill back in. And no, I, and I'll, I have I'll a question. Or is there, go ahead. I'll let you answer. Well, actually, to anybody, um, you were talking about the teacher preparation, but other than looking at test scores, what's the evaluation criteria? How do you judge how effective the teacher is after all the preparation? Bill? Well, first of all, uh, in many of the accreditation, uh, can we call them principles, when you take a look at not only an end of course learning outcomes assessment, but you also look at program level assessment, that there are direct and indirect measures that one can use. They can be tests, they can be practicums where a person is really hands on. Think of nursing, for instance, and really trying to bring real life context into the theory and the quantitative aspects of things. Because I'm a, a person who learned through doing. All right, how about you? Kevin, learn through doing. Learn through doing, right? And what's fascinating is I often find that teachers cannot answer the question, so what? So what, man? Doctor? Why do I need to know this? Now, so what about being able to write an APA style in a scholarly way? So what? So one of the things that our faculty tries to do is constantly address the contextual importance of so what based upon quantitative and qualitative models. So uh, so that's the, that is a challenge. Oh, it's a big one. And if I could just interject this, otherwise, you guys learn by doing. I learn, I'm, I go like 360 in like a minute. And, and some of the things we're saying up here are very, very important. Um, I was just thinking this driving down to six this morning. And just doing the research on this, I have the utmost respect for, ed, for educators. In fact, in the book, I talk about where I, what I would do is I would start kids out of college at $65,000. Lou Gerster, who's in the book, former CEO of IBM, he says that's too low. He wants kids to be paid $100,000 know, to teach. But what it's akin to, how many of you are in business? Yeah, a lot of you, right? So what we're talking about here is testing. I don't want to move on to some other things here. I want to get your questions here, because this is your, your breakfast. But it's like us in business, you know, we've had no child left behind for 10 years. Guess what? That's not good enough. We've got Common Core coming after K, K, to, K to 12 teachers in, in the next 12. It's like us in business saying, oh, okay, Gary, you give me a measure on the top line. Saying, no, 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 we don't, we don't think that. 
You know, we want to measure you on customer satisfaction. No, 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 no. We want to me measure you on blah, 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 blah. It's so incredibly difficult to teach. And just one last thing, and I'll get, get you guys. I was with a guy named Art Levine uh, a couple of weeks ago in Austin. Art uh, was president of Columbia Teacher College. Great guy. You just sit there and listen to him, and you just get the pen out, because every other word out of his mouth, you're writing it down. Now he's at Woodrow Wilson in Princeton University. He was talking about testing, then we'll get right to your questions. He said, testing in America, testing in America is done akin to if when you leave here, your GPS, how many of you have GPS systems in your car? Or whatever, in your smartphone. He goes, it's akin to having a GPS that calibrates every hour. So when Doug left his house today, leaves the driveway, blah, 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 but he said, here to come to the highest golf course, you know, 60 minutes later, correction, correction, recalibrating, recalibrating, you're 80 miles off course. So what, what Levine is, and I don't know how we're going to, but it's going to leverage technology. We're going to get into technology education here soon, but we've got to have a little more real-time testing. Yes, we have a couple questions here. Uh, actually, what I wanted to just clarify Hi. one thing, too, is you had kind of asked, were you asking like, what, once a teacher is in the system, how, they, how they're tested, how they're, is that what you were evaluating? Because remember, these guys actually are at, are at teaching schools, and they're teaching new teachers to be teachers. But I wasn't sure if this is what you're asking, but this is, this is one thing that's important, is that once the teacher's out there, and it, like all those people taking the MTELs, only new teachers need to take the MTELs. So basically, the people who've been teaching them for 20 years don't need to take the MTELs. That's, and I wasn't sure if that's what you were asking. How are those teachers evaluated? And they're evaluated based on whatever the monarchy in that public school district wants to do. Not necessarily what you guys want to do. Right? Plus so the unions. Just, what's that? Plus the unions. But <laughs> I didn't want to mention that word, but that's okay. But that's, that's a huge thing. Wiley and Son maybe edited out, edited out that chapter in my book. But, uh. Oh, did you? <laughs> Yeah, After I'll tell you how. No how, public school teacher will buy that book, right? That's a your union card. Oh, I think school right? teachers will buy the book if I'm out there saying they should get paid sixty-five thousand dollars. But but it's anyway. Uh, okay. So but anyway, that's I mean, one of the big pieces, and now you mentioned the word. I guess I'm allowed to say it too. Is that, <laughs> that basically the we are going to get the technology in education <laughs> soon? Well, because you need to break through oh, that, that concept. You do have to do the public the, the, the development, the professional development for the teachers that are ingraining that. But anyway, I must tell you, because it seems like we've got chuckles in the audience here. Anybody here, Scott Walker? Scott Walker is governor of Wisconsin. Yeah. Um, yeah. Remember, he got elected, and then they go, we don't really like this guy because he's trying to take away collective bargaining rights for state and municipal workers. The one minute version of how teacher unions became teacher unions is teacher unions have been around since 1857, when the NEA, National Education Association, was founded as the National Teachers Association. And some think it should be named also the National Teachers Association because something that doesn't have anything to do with all the education, it's all about the union members. Fast forward to 1958. Gaylord Nelson wins the gubernatorial race in Wisconsin. First time a Democrat won in 25 years. What happens when you win? You get political capital. January of 59, he goes, I'm gonna give state municipal workers the power of collective bargaining. Didn't go over that well with the state legislature. At the 11th hour, uh, I forget which party was in power, so I think it was Republicans. They decided to add the Wisconsin Education Association to the bill, thinking that if they did, it would be voted down. Well, they guessed wrong. And the bill passed, and the Wisconsin Education said, oh my god, we got a collective bargaining. What's this? It didn't do anything with two years until a guy named Abe Levine in New York City, one day before the President Kennedy, or the Senator Kennedy, Vice President Nixon election in New York, he went on strike and in, at that time, there were 800,000 members of teacher unions in America. You go from November 60 to now, there's now about 4.5 million teacher union members. That's how that, that's how that. But anyway. I'm going to help you get back to technology. Yeah, please. Because you know, here's the deal, is it comes down to all, all the municipalities, the towns, have to fight the union. So what I'm curious about, I hear you guys saying professional development and get technology into the teacher's hands. How can you do that? Is there a central bucket of money from the state? Because that's where it's got to come from. Because it can't come from the towns. The towns are broke. Okay, so, so And I know you, so, so, so now, get it back to the Your name technology. Is? My name is Sue Sue. I'm, I'm, I'm a school teacher. Sue, Sue has brought us back in to, how, how, how do you, 
it, it's, it's good, because my first question, which we haven't even got to yet, um, <laughs> is, you know, I, I have covers of uh, IDG, you know, this is a 1983 cover, 1993 cover of Macworld magazine, it goes America's Shame. It talks about how PCs came into the schools in the mid-70s, and we didn't know what to do with them. So, and I think, Bill, you were saying, you know, it, it has things that have moved. So, the first question, I just kind of framed up a little bit here for as well, though. Um, and I showed you the picture of the teacher who kept using the classroom in 1927. Is technology been a benefit or a boondoggle in education? And when I want to talk about post secondary, but overall, you know, is is it been helpful? Is there measurable things that you've seen in your professional careers that say, hey look, using this has helped? Absolutely. In what way? Absolutely. Now, Technology has allowed individualized learning, mm -hmm. time on task rather than seat time. You just, just look at that. You have to look yeah, at that. I mean, seat time was how we all learn. You sit in a, in a college class after 45 hours, whether you got it or not, you got three credits or not. Now it's about competency, as Bill was talking about, learning outcomes. Have you learned what the expectations are for that course? And we will measure you on that learning so we know you actually learned it. It was all about inputs, both in K through well, as well as college, and now it's about outputs. It's not about seat times, what do you know? It's not how many books in the library is, are people actually have informational literacy. So it's, education has really been turned on its head both from K through 16. Um, as an educator, if you don't know what students should be learning, the skills and competencies they need to pass your course, you're not doing your job anymore. And before it was just and with the 40 out of five hours, give them a grade. Those days are over in most, most colleges. Well, and technology really is an enabler for us to do more real-time real assessment of competency. Many of us now use a technique uh, where we will embed a, to say, um, a simulator, or even a game, in fact, a Cape uh, 2.0. It's a game, by the way, I signed up. I just want you to know I'm an iPad freak. <laughs> But what's fascinating about it is we can literally today put together um, a class, whether it be online, whether it be hybrid, whether it be face-to-face, -face, and we can use technology to, in chunk of bits, break up learning in smaller increments over a, over a lecture even and then assess it at the end of the course as well as real time on a session by session basis. So it's, a, it's particularly exciting because for somebody who learns by doing, you get to hit the rewind button and go back and do it again, learn it, re re rewind. So it takes memorization to a point where you're actually touching it. Go please follow uh, Please go ahead. Yeah, please go ahead. I may be a bit of a heretic here, but um, I, I have questions about the testing, and it's based in part of the, the testing processes. Um, in my experience, I happen to be very gifted in taking multiple choice tests, um, and I always did well on them without trying very hard. One of my best friends in law school, now a federal district court judge, barely passed the LSATs the multiple choice part of the bar exam. Um, I happened to be listening to Nate Silver uh, from the 538 column in the New York Times, who was pointing out that even though he's a st statistical freak. Um, but a good reporter. A good reporter. Uh, when, when you're a statistician, you tend to place higher value on things that can be quantified. And are we, are we focusing too much, are the tests really capturing what we need to be teaching, or are we teaching to the test? Let, let me let take Gene's question here and reframe in terms of, I mean, you could answer Gene's question, but answer it also through this lens. Folks out here, at least from what I've learned in terms of researching this, this book, is the skills that employers are looking for, besides the quantitative aspects you know, the gene here, he's not going to go on to reset right because he got 800 in both verbal and math. He can't get any more higher than 1,600. But um, the skills, and for, the, for those of you who are interested, write this down. The Institute for the Future, 
Workforce 2020. Because what I'm going to give you right now is just base stuff. But if you go on that website, Institute for the Future, you'll find the most incredible amount of skills that employers need that are that are not as easy to quantify as science math. Okay. Those skills are being critical. Thinking, how do you collaborate? How do you communicate? You have, how do you build confidence? So take Gene's question. Well, oh, terms of well, you they, said, you I said, teach these other things. That how many here think they need that kind of stuff in the workforce that come out of Cray or what have you? He mentions oh. critical thinking, right? So probably the most exciting part of critical thought is synthesis. So when we think about synthesis, synthesis is really the intersection of taking quantitative, qualitative, and experiential learning and really coming up with something that's new or something that's pertinent. So when we really think about how tests need to be redone, and they do, tests aren't just sitting in front of a terminal at the DMV and, and answering multiple choice questions, though you're very good at it. I might not be good at it at all. But when you start to add in this experiential learning aspect of things and put context to the theory, to the formula, to the action, and you say, oh, by the way, you have to get up in front of a crowd and explain these things. You actually have to be able to communicate in a clear way, and you marry that with a mathematician from MIT, all of a sudden, you have something that will win, and you have teachers that can actually get across to, well, why does it matter? And so, granted, the tests are, to my mind, shallow, and they need to be multi-dimensional. And we have a lot of work to do in that area. Following up on that, just briefly, because um, we could be here for like three hours. Oh, yeah. Gosh, we're just getting going. It's only got 15 minutes. But you were talking about it earlier in terms of experiential, and I know we talked about the conference call we had last week. This whole thing of you know, Salman Khan. How many here have heard of the Khan Academy? Mm -hmm. yeah, it's kind of that experiential. You would get the, get the results back pretty quickly. Is that kind of stuff you're talking about? Well, yeah, I always like to ask the question, did you normally take Bob, come on, you yeah, know, just kind of bump me. But, but, and then I'll pass it to, the, to, to uh, my friend here to the left. Con, first of all, how many have actually done an online class? How many have done it? How many have gone into Con and taken a look at it? How many, how many, have enrolled, how many are enrolled in a MOOC right now? A MOOC? How many have, know what a MOOC is? Okay. All right, good. You you know, how many are enrolled in a MOOC? Okay, I am. You are. Yeah, let's see. So, so the, the answer the answer has to do with we as leaders finding a way to help our teachers and help our students arrive at some type of again contextual intersection where they can take all those things and put it together. I'll shut up. Well, I, right. I think you I think you make a very good point. I personally don't think tests are very effective in terms of traditional tests how we approach them. And I, I have to look at outcomes as well, because I don't think some of the learning outcomes are particularly effective either. If you, particularly if you look at entry-level STEM courses, you often find that the outcomes are a series of points of theory and so on that you have to get to, but they're never pulled together in a way that you can actually see how they all work. And so I, I think we need to move testing, not from, from, from the multiple choice, to the hands-on project to create something to fix something to see how it actually works in the real world. I like MOOCs, actually. I like online courses, but they're not for everybody. And I think if you look at the success and the retention rates for students who take them, there's a huge difference. And if you look at the MOOCs, the retention is only about 8%. Some, some folks who are not as astute as this group here, Bob, they look at MOOCs as, because the you know, University of Southern New Hampshire has done a good job yeah. online. Um, cost of higher education is, is just amazing. How many here of Scott McNeil? You remember Scott used to run Sun? He has an idea. He'd like to bring down, you guys would like this, he'd like to bring it, the cost of college tuition way, way down. In exchange for the students, once they graduate and get a job, the university gets 10% of their gross wages for the first five years. But our MOOCs and things like Solomon Khan, the Khan Academy, Udacity, Coursera, you know, uh, the list goes on. Are these complementary? They're obviously all leverage technology. Are they complementary, or are they like in, in the media business? You know, the internet is just eviscerated print. You know, are they going to replace higher ed and in K twelve? Or what's your sense? 
I personally look at them as being complementary. I don't look at them as embracing any of them. Now, I just want to keep it, because we only got 10 minutes. Uh, Ruth, complementary or? Absolutely complementary. Okay. Nope. Complementary, for sure. Great. I have a question back here. Gentlemen, you aren't sure you have a question? Yeah, so, one of the things I hear about, I hear about like, evaluation of students, you know, um, do you guys ever consider maybe employability of students once they leave the, once they leave the organization? I do a lot of hiring, especially a lot of hiring technology. Now we've probably also talked to some people here before. I can't hire American students. What's that? Uh, they don't have the skills to do the job. What skills do you need? So I need software development, and I basically need the whole range of software development, anything having to do with technology, computers, like using websites, designing websites, using computers, using technology to solve, to solve problems. We already have people who can come up with business ideas. I need people that can physically actually do the work. And if I have a list of resumes, and I take like Ukrainian, Chinese, Indian, American, British, basically Eastern European, the Americans at the bottom of the list, they're the last ones I look at. Because they simply don't have the skills, to, the basic skills to do software development. How do you guys answer proof? Well, one of the biggest trends in colleges now is that students start internships, so what we call experiential learning, very early in their career. And so that they know what the world of work, the expectations are, and get much clearer about what it is they need to learn. So you're looking for the internships, the companies and internships, to teach them the basic skills to do the work instead of, instead of the teaching. Complementary. So the internship should be aligned with the force work. And having more faculty get out into the workforce to, to better align those expectations with what's being taught in the classroom. I think you too, though. I think you hit it on the head. I think the issue really is what are we really teaching in the classroom? Because I think if you look at the offerings, the class of offerings in terms of, let's say, in IT and software development, there's a disconnect between what's going on in the real world. And we have to do a better job of connecting those dots so that what is being offered is really relevant and, it's, and, and it can be readily transferred. I spend a lot of time out talking to different businesses because it's integral that when we're talking about outcomes, we're building programs, that we understand what people need to have. And that in turn is, you know, there are the soft skills, there are the internships, they help, but we really got to do a better job of understanding what the business world needs and what they what the systems need to be successful. Yeah. And I'm sorry, I'm just looking at time that what you're saying. I think, I think, I think one of the real issues here is that the academic world moves very slowly. And if you want to change a program, it's a, you might as well talk about changing the, the, the putting a windmill up here on page 32. It's about the we same all type of speed, out that okay? type of We have to get faster, we have to get better, we have to accept change that this is what we really need to be. And we have to be able to react and build and create, and we're not really doing that effectively right now. But to do this, we need to have the business community Help yeah, us with yes, curriculum design. design. Absolutely. Perfect. So, so if I think about the technology, it really is it ASP.NET, is it PHP? What is it that you need? If I ask that question, and we build curriculum in partnership with uh, a, a firm, let's say Convention Data Services, for instance, uh, is certainly as we look for people, we want to make sure they have those hard skills, but we also want them to be able to to write and present and actually talk to customers. And so often, if I take a look at my time in India, so often I had these genius programmers from India, but it took an awful lot of heavy listening to get them to the point you know, where they could talk to customers and be able to do that. So, so there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of wisdom by talking to someone like you and saying, well, what do you need? I could, but but could just one yeah, please. on that aspect, at the, at the Cape Cod Community College, we're starting an engineering advanced manufacturing program in September. We built that curriculum by conversations with companies on the Cape as to what they want to see in their students. So we worked with the Hydro, the Telemed Methods, the Claim Research, and others to, to build those curriculums. The idea, though, as we move on with this, is that we're not going to be teaching the students just in the classroom. Part of this is a partnership, so at some point, some of, this, some of these courses are going to be on the shop floors of these companies. The students need to understand how it really works. And, and they also have to see whether they really like this stuff, too. So you have to give them a chance. But the biggest point is the soft skills. 
you know, we talk about students today, are they technology savvy? I'll say no, I'll be the first to say that. But they're really good at, at cell phones, and texting, and tweeting, and doing Facebook. They don't talk really well. And if you're gonna be hired today, you gotta be on a shop floor, you gotta be an engineer, you gotta be a technician, you gotta be a customer service rep, you gotta be in the field with customers. You have to be able to communicate first and foremost. If I'm hiring somebody, I've done a lot of hiring, I don't really, you're, everybody's technically skilled. I need somebody that can actually interface with another human being. So you have to do that. My, my son works at Accenture. He, uh, right out of college, uh, he was like Gene. He had you know, good quantifiable scores on the math side. And you know, he finds the, one of the biggest challenges he has is his cross-cultural kind of working with workers around the world. And he would not disagree with your name? Barrett. Barrett? Barrett's comment. Because uh, he finds sometimes workers from around the world that are on these virtual teams kind of think in straight rows and columns and, and the other side. But you know, the point that Bob and, and Ruth and Bill brought up is, and I'm glad Bob's doing it, is I was at a conference in Austin. We were talking about this very same issue of public-private partnerships. And someone in the audience was saying, you know, blah, blah, blah. So somebody on the panel goes, let me ask you, how many times have you reached out to a high school, to a junior college, to a four-year school in your area to, to share with them what you need. Is technology and education made too easy for young Americans in terms of it's just there with a swipe of a finger or now with the Samsung thing? Well, this, this reminds me of someone else. Uh, his name is Nicholas Carr. Has anybody heard of sure. Nicholas Carr? Nicholas Carr asked the question in an Atlantic, uh, 2008 Atlantic article. Is Google making us stupid? <laughs> that is the, and by the way, it's at the, the Atlantic, uh, Google, uh, oh my God, making us stupid, right? It, so his question is particularly poignant uh, as, he, as he really takes a look as far back as Socrates, and that he, he basically quotes Socrates as saying, we should not have the written word, because if we have the written word, we will forget how to think, and we will become atrophied in our thought process. So I just took you back to Socrates, and then forward you to the manager of and Google, right? So the answer is simple. The written word is something that most of us appreciate. And these technologies, though, are really fairly new when you think about global history. So we need to find out how to do it better. But to follow up with you, Bill, and Bob, and, and Ruth, and again, uh, again, I'm just a liberal arts guy, I'm listening to Mary's question and your answer, I have to frame it again in terms of technology education. Is technology dumbing down America? Well, we're finding in our students, and you may see it too, if they walk around with a button in the room all the time. You're on social media all the time. And so they're having far less interpersonal relationships in colleges. They don't talk to one another, even if they're in the next room in, the, in their housing situation. Or next door. That's right. So, so, you're so this or the car. Room, That's it. The soft skills we're talking about have become the hard skills. These students wow. do That's not good. have them. And that's the kind of scheme <laughs> when you think about what kind of workers will we have. And the whole notion of social media, when you look and see how much time young students, very young students, are, uh, are spending with the technology rather than active play and interaction with others and using their imagination for creative play, that's, I think, an incredible downside of the technology. And, and, and I thank you for what was very articulately said. I, I want to just move, but it's okay. That when I was down here on the Cape, a couple months ago, and there was uh, the Cape, some, some group down here in the Cape did a study on how young people are leaving this beautiful place in droves. And the age, the median age of the population here in the Cape is getting older. So the question I have you know, for you guys, and we'll maybe start with Bob and then we'll do it this way. You know, the whole, what we used to call it, you know, like, we used to call it shop when we were in high school, and now it's career technology education, which is great. And we used to call it 
adult education, when everything else was juvenile education. <laughs> How can we leverage technology, the question, in terms of the workforce? There's a lot of very, very competent, skilled workers here at Cape Cod and on the mainland. How can technology education you know, help those people Again, there's 21 million people who are either unemployed or unemployed. How do we do that? Well, one of the ways you can do it is I mean, use online training to take the education to people. So the MOOCs? Come to education. Yeah. MOOCs, local school online courses, modules which relate to simple, to that are focused towards job needs in the community. We can actually bring people in and work through workforce investment boards and build programs that are specific to the needs of the community and offer people who have been displaced or are underemployed the opportunity to, to learn a new skill and to, do, to get a better job. Part of the issue that we face here, though, is, is that we need to expand the economy here. It's largely healthcare and hospitality. We have to build it so it's more than that. And a lot of the students who have interests are young, look at it as not having a great deal of opportunity, so they leave. Later they find out it's a really good place to raise a family, they come back. We still have to build a job here for them. Part of what we're trying to do is, as, uh, has a cave is build a community STEM strategy where together we're building a program so that we're, everything is equal. We're not school choices out of the equation where if regardless of where you go, regardless of what grade level you're in, you'll have the best education you can have and create the opportunity. I think part of the issue that we all face, whether we're on a cave or somewhere else, is that by and large, that teachers who I have tremendous respect for at every level, unless you've been in a STEM career, you really don't know what it is, and you really don't know how to describe it, and you really don't know how to tell a student what's involved and how to do that. Can I just follow up with you on that? Yeah. Maybe about five minutes. Yeah. Doug gave us 15 extra. So uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Douglas. Um, now I forgot what I was going to ask you. Uh, you were just mentioning, what's the, yeah. the last thought you had? It was about uh, teachers not learning. Oh, 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 thank you. So in the back here, my good friend Chris Carroll, I've known him for almost 30 years. His wife Nancy worked in the workforce and now teaches in, in, in K, K5 or whatever. One of the big challenges we have in America is, particularly in middle school, a fairly high percentage of teachers teach math and science, quote unquote, out of field, simply meaning they're not that they're not good teachers, but they have, don't have any graduate degrees in science. Is there, is there an opportunity for, for workers? How could, how could, you know, second career workers fill that gap, or can they? I, I think it, it can be difficult in a, in a public school system to do that. However, if, if, if in terms of job wise, volunteer wise is another part. Yeah, so it's, it's, again, I'm, I'm not being rude here you know, uh, to Bob, but I, I know your time, I know you're going to get to work, but uh, pretty soon the uh, Feeney Golf Group is going to be coming in here because it's raining out there. They're, they're so excited about what we're talking here. They're going to say, forget to take the white ball. We're going to come here and learn something. Uh, but I want to be cognizant of you, know, you guys paid for breakfast here. We've got a couple more minutes. Questions that you might have, we could, we could, we could bring up any. Yes? Uh, Joan McDonald. I work for the Workforce Investment Board and do a lot of school to career right. for high school because my focus is on youth. And I mean, I've talked to Bob about creating programs where we can bring businesses into the school so that they can bring real world working problems to students so they understand that what they're learning in math and science is relevant. And that's from you know grade three or four up that because I think that Desi right now is concentrating on, you know, the developing college and career readiness for nine to twelve and I'm like it's too late. They need to start early so that they kids recognize that there's opportunities, and when they make choices later on, they haven't, you know, hurt themselves by, oh well, I'm not smart in math, so I'm not going to do that, and then realize, oh, I really want to be an engineer. Um, so, a part of, you know, my work is working with the school and also working with businesses to try and make those connections, um, developing a a speakers bureau so that my school to career teachers can look online for businesses that would be willing to come into the classroom. Um, and also, because the Cape has such an issue with transportation, that kids often can't do internships because they can't get there. So my, my personal goal is how do I bring the internship into the classroom so that kids can do an, an in-classroom internship but is still dealing with a business problem 
Um, Anybody want to comment on it? Because I will have one more question and then we'll let you guys go. Anybody? Well, uh, first of all, <coughs> bringing, bringing the classroom to the business and vice versa. Uh, I, I love bringing the business to the classroom, but we try to do that as much as uh, possible because what it, what it really does do is it helps us define what it is the business wants. It also shows the student that you care enough and maybe you ignite their interest in one of the hard skills as well as the uh, personal skills that they need to develop. It's, uh, it's, it's, to me it seems almost insane that business is not directly connected to education. And coming from business 35 years of general management experience, I always had that problem, the same problem when I would try to hire someone. So I've lived it. We don't have the answer. It's going to take all of us to work it out. Yeah, because we offer externships. Um, last year, I like that. Last year, no no teacher took us up on it. And they were paid a thousand dollars to work forty hours and develop curriculum for their classroom and develop a relationship with the business. Now I'm hoping that with the new kind of um, assessments that teachers are going to have, that doing externships is kind of a part of the whole professional development plan. Um, so, but also making sure that teachers have the opportunity to work with local businesses to really understand what they're doing and then bringing it back to the kids in the classroom. That's, that's great. Could you, before you leave, just give me your card? Yeah. Like it. We have time for one more question. Yes, I'm looking right at you. Uh, I'm Mary Sullivan. I teach hey, at Mary. Community College um, in the math department, and I'm also a founding member of a group called Cape Cod Makers. And we're oh. a nonprofit that is that aims to bring together people that are making things on the Cape. Um, and we just actually had our first public meeting in March, and we've had very great support. Uh, people that are just tinkering in their garage, to people that are using technology at the workplace, scientists, engineers. Um, and what we want to do is we want to create this network of people that are making things. We want to offer classes. We've actually offered some workshops over the past couple of weeks. We've been supported um, by the Cape Cod Technology Council, and we've been very grateful for their support. We had a course in Introduction to Python Programming that got a great response. This week we had a course in Microcontrollers. Next week we'll have a course in Electricity taught by Chris Connors. He's an art, art and engineering educator, he writes for Make Magazine. Um, so we're pulling people in that are actually using technology in their jobs. They can communicate what's really out there. Uh, our eventual goal is to start a maker space or two on the Cape, and uh, we're going to need a lot of help to make that happen. Uh, maker space, I don't know if people are familiar with the concept. I wasn't until last November, but maker spaces are popping up all over the country. Uh, I was introduced to the idea by going to an open house up in Somerville, the Artisans Asylum. It's a 40,000 square foot maker space that allows people to come in and share tools and share equipment. Uh, things like 3D printers, things like CNC machines. It also pulls in traditional arts and crafts, metalworking, jewelry making, Great. pull all that stuff together, and magic happens. That's 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 wonderful, and I appreciate that. I would I would highly, 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 highly endorse. And how many here? Just curiosity. I never heard of the makers movement or before Mary brought it up. Just a couple. Or oh, Chris, uh, you know it. Uh, it's really cool. And if you like, I know Dale Darty, who's the co-founder, so maybe we can get him out to the Cape uh, in, in the next year to get to talk. But um, one last question. Anybody else have a question for the panelists? I don't want you guys get to get to work. Yes, we got one right here. The question I have is this, is it, maybe this is a more philosophical question. No, we like philosophical when, last when, questions. When children are learning, do they, it seems like we teach in a linear fashion. And when children's brains, when they're young, it's not linear, but that's how we teach. And you talk about the connectivity of pulling things together. Maybe the uh, maybe we need to do more. Um, don't think in terms of linear, but think in terms of not so much wholeness, but um, how the mind works. The mind doesn't work in a linear fashion. Your name. Lois Andre. Lois. I don't have Ruth to ask that, but I also, that's a commercial for, to go on the Institute for the Future and click on their work, Future of Work 2020, and you will see 
10 examples of the skills that are needed in terms of not just thinking and learning. Uh, you all three of you guys want to answer, uh, comment on the You want to start with? And I'd go back in three Dr. Root. It's the, Dr. Root. It is the approach to and learning. And, and exactly what you're saying, if you look at inquiry-based learning and how to solve problems, you can't approach it in a linear way. You must. But that's how we're teaching it. That's well, how we're doing it. We're doing it. Well, the, if you look at the content, and I'm sure that some of that is online about how to solve a problem, the teachers will no longer be able to teach it that way because you can't <coughs> solve the problem that way. So it's a, it's a whole, it's, it's very exciting to look at the new curriculums that are being developed. I think we're going to have to provide a lot of teacher support to be able to actually teach in a new way. Thank you. Uh, Bill, you want to comment, Bob, then we'll just do oh, a quick wrap. First of all, if I, if I look back to the guilds and how young people were brought up, this, this, well, let's use my mother's bakery. Okay, at three years of age, I was making dough, and I did learn different things about business when I was four. But no one pulled it together for me to, to basically say, "Mark, do you know what you're learning?" That the math, for instance, about making cinnamon rolls makes sense. So no one really brought that together. So all of my teachers were quite sequential and quite gifted in their discipline. We often, this is a real flaw, do not talk to one another. Folks from different disciplines do not talk to one another. And sometimes you might share a wall in an office. And so the challenge, of course, is for us to become more connected as a world faculty, if you will. And when I say world faculty, I include the business community. You know, so, so that we can, in fact, craft that. But in some places, it's starting to percolate. In some places, it is. Uh, people fight. Thanks, Bill. Bob, that last word. I most actually agree with you. We are linear, we think linear, we approach teaching linear, we can't. We have to look at it from the discovery mode, the inquiry base, get people to get lawsuits, get their hands on things, allow them to solve problems. <coughs> to do that, we have to go back to professional development because we have to allow teachers to the time to actually develop the lesson plans, the projects that allow, that allow them to do that. And we haven't been able we haven't done that, and that's the missing piece. And it takes teams. It takes teams. You can't do it by yourself. <coughs> so you have to teach a team. Well, that's, that's a good way to, good way to stop the this whole inclusive aspect that this is not the challenge of just educators. It's not just the challenge of business. It's not just public, public private partnerships. It's inclusive. And let me frame it. We're not talking about, about just education here. The reason why we need to do a better job in all the things we've discussed over the last hour and 15 minutes are three things. The future economic strength of our country, the future employability. Everybody talks about global sourcing. Ain't the right word. It's local sourcing. Somebody over here was talking about it. You know, they, this gentleman here, Jared, was saying, you know, you know, if, if someone with a keyboard and an internet connection, he can hire anywhere around the world. And that's not outsourcing. That's local sourcing. And it's also about, we were talking, Doug and I and others, uh, about, about one of my favorite movies, it scares the bejesus out of me. You can find it on YouTube with the search about page five. It's called Fail Safe. It's about the future strength of our national security. We need, we have to do a better job at creating more young men and women with skills that are quantitative and collaborative. Uh, I must also say, Bill was just talking about uh, sharing walls and offices. It's down in Austin, I mentioned earlier, a couple of weeks ago. One of the big takeaways was a slide that TI, Texas Instrument, had on the screen. If I had the power to do it, I would go into every single one of the 15,000 school districts in America and rip out every single desk and have a huge barn fire in our country and replace them with tables like Lois is leaning on here. Put pods in every classroom. You want to force collaboration? You want to force communication? You want to do that? Just start at the desks. So anyway, I'll close with this Chinese problem. Uh, it says, you know, I see and I forget. I read and I remember. I do and I understand. So with that, Thank you all.
purpose. This is starting your Friday here, your weekend. You are our great panelists, and hopefully, I know it for me, I've got a lot of, a lot of information that hopefully I'm going to do something with, and I know that hopefully you will also. And with that, I'll send it back to our host, Doug, who will thank our panelists and, and close the morning. That's right. Thank you.